Hello, I'm Professor Sims. In this video, we'll be discussing catabolism of carbohydrates, lipids and proteins, photosynthesis, and biogeochemical cycle. This is the eighth of 10 lessons included in my Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you're currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and Moodle site for assignments and other course information. So the learning objectives for Lesson 8 include describing glycolysis, its products, and also describing the Krebs cycle and its products. Uh, we'll also talk about lipid catabolism, protein catabolism, photosynthetic pigments, light-dependent reactions, light-independent reactions, and we'll look at cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And then also we will look into biogeochemical cycles of carbon, nitrogen, and sugar sugar, and uh, just briefly talk about bioremediation. Glycolysis is one of the three major metabolic pathways. The three major metabolic pathways being glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and then of course electron transport chain. We talked about the electron transport chain or the electron transport system in lesson seven. Glycolysis catabolizes glucose, and it does so via a process that's called substrate level phosphorylation. Now we talked about oxidative phosphorylation when we were talking about ETC. Substrate level phosphorylation, it forms ATP by uh, directly transferring a phosphoryl group to ADP. So it transfers this phosphoryl group from another compound, another phosphorylated compound, it takes it off of that and it adds it to ADP directly. There's no intermediate steps involved. Unlike oxidative phosphorylation, the oxidation and the phosphorylation are not coupled. So in oxidative phosphorylation in ETC, you need both things to be happening. You have to have electron donors and acceptors and, and all of this. It's more complicated. I'm gonna show you a figure of substrate level phosphorylation in just a second. But I wanted to mention that while oxidative phosphorylation produces is ADP in aerobic or anaerobic. So in aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. In anaerobic respiration, it's uh, an alternative to oxygen. Another organic compound is the electron acceptor. Substrate level phosphorylation is totally independent of electron acceptors and that's because of this direct phosphorylation of ADP. So that means that glycolysis does not depend on oxygen. This is figure 811 and it's showing ATP made during glycolysis via substrate level phosphorylation. One of the two enzymatic reactions in the energy payoff phase, okay, so we'll talk about uh, energy payoff and energy investment in just a second. I'm skipping ahead a little bit to the payoff phase because I want to show y'all substrate level phosphorylation. So here we've got pyruvate kinase, which is an enzyme. This is showing the active site of the enzyme. The substrate that binds to this active site, there's two of them. You have phosphoenol pyruvate and ADP. So phosphoenol pyruvate, this is that phosphorylated compound that we were talking about in the last slide. It gives up this phosphate group and it is added to ADP directly to form ATP energy. And this is substrate level phosphorylation. So they call it substrate level because it is substrates that bind to an active site of an enzyme and then the product ATP. This is the energy investment phase of glycolysis and essentially what is happening is it takes energy to make energy. It uses two ATP molecules to phosphorylate glucose. So when you are adding the phosphate group to glucose, that is an anabolic reaction and anabolic reactions, anabolism requires energy. But then the energy payoff phase harnesses the energy, producing four ATP molecules, two NADH molecules, and two pyruvates. So the second part, the second part of this figure is showing catabolic reactions where you have pyruvate that's being formed from glucose 
and then all of these products are formed, but they're all smaller than the original product. So this energy investment phase is the anabolic reaction. It requires input of energy. It's inorganic. And the energy payoff phase is the catabolic part of it. It's exergonic. It releases energy. The uh, products of glycolysis, and it did say it on that last figure, but it is 2 NADH, 2 pyruvate, and then it nets 2 ATP. It makes 4 ATP molecules altogether, but since it required the use of 2 ATP molecules in the beginning, the net product is 2 ATPs. So after glycolysis, the pyruvate that's made during glycolysis becomes decarboxylated and it forms an acetyl group. The acetyl group is coupled with the formation of NADH. So that's another example of an exergonic and inorganic reactions being coupled together. This acetyl group attaches to what is known as coenzyme A. A co coenzyme A is a carrier compound, um, and I'll show you that in a figure here in just a minute. This is the transition step between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. The coenzyme A actually transports this acetyl group into the Krebs cycle where the two carbons from the acetyl group enter as substrates for the Krebs cycle. Each round of the Krebs cycle yields 3 NADH, 1 FADH2, 1 ATP, and 2 carbon dioxide molecules. Some of the intermediate products of the Krebs cycle are routinely used to chemically synthesize things like amino acids, chlorophylls, fatty acids, and of course nucleotides. So this is coenzyme A, and this is how it looks before the acetyl acid group attaches. And then after glycolysis, the acetyl acid then binds, there's a peptide bond here, to coenzyme A. And you can see just by looking at it, I mean, look at, look at this monster, it's huge. And when that acetyl group binds, it's really quite easy for another compound to come and cleave this off. So that's why they call co coenzyme A a carrier molecule because it's really just kind of holding on to that acetyl group until it can be used in the Krebs cycle. Oh, I'm going to back up just for a second here. I want to show you just a really, really quick video. Cells derive energy from the oxidation of nutrients such as glucose. The oxidation of glucose to pyruvate occurs through a series of steps called glycolysis. The energy released during these oxidation reactions is used to form adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy currency of the cell. The initial steps in glycolysis are the additions of two phosphates to the glucose molecule at the expense of two molecules of ATP. The result is a six carbon sugar diphosphate molecule and two low energy adenosine diphosphate molecules or ADP. This six carbon sugar diphosphate molecule is then split into two three carbon molecules. Each of the three carbon molecules is converted through a series of steps to pyruvate. During these reactions electrons are transferred to the coenzyme NAD plus to form NADH and ATP is formed. Under aerobic conditions the pyruvate is is further oxidized to yield more ATP and under anaerobic conditions the pyruvate is converted into lactic acid. During glycolysis glucose is broken down to pyruvate. A two carbon fragment of pyruvate is used to form acetyl CoA. The acetyl CoA enters the Krebs cycle which occurs in the mitochondrion. During the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA carbon dioxide CO2 is produced and a molecule of NADH is formed. The two carbon acetyl portion of the acetyl CoA is transferred to a four carbon molecule, producing a six carbon compound. The CoA carrier molecule is released. Carbon dioxide is then released from the six carbon molecule, forming a five carbon compound. In this step, hydrogen is removed and transferred to NAD plus to form NADH. Next, a second oxidation and decarboxylation occurs. Again, NADH and carbon dioxide are produced. In addition, 
addition, a molecule of ATP is produced. As a result of these reactions, a four-carbon molecule is formed in the Krebs cycle. Finally, the four-carbon molecule is further oxidized and the hydrogens that are removed are used to form NADH and FADH2. These reactions regenerate the four-carbon molecule that initially reacts with acetyl COA. Each glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules during glycolysis. Then, each pyruvate is converted to acetyl COA, which enters the Krebs cycle. Thus, for each glucose molecule, the Krebs cycle must complete two circuits to completely break down the two pyruvate molecules. This is figure 813 showing a schematic diagram of the Krebs cycle. They call this the citric acid cycle as well. These are the two acetyl-CoA, the acetic acid compounds that were yielded after glycolysis, and then these are coenzyme A's, and they literally carry them into the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. It says here, note the results of this reaction are CO2, NADH, FADH, and ATP. And this also, just like glycolysis, is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. And then it says two turns of the Krebs cycle are required to process all of the carbon from one glucose molecule. In here, and the intermediate products that become substrates for the next enzymatic reaction. The stepwise process, it is a long pathway and you have NAD, NAD plus that goes in and then it is oxidized, it adds hydrogen to that. That's where you get your NADH similar to the FADH2, this is an oxidation, and then CO2 is a byproduct. This here is a much more complicated diagram, but essentially it is just showing the intermediate products which then become substrates for the subsequent reactions. And these intermediate products are used to synthesize amino acids, fatty acids, and nucleotides. So it is showing here where heme and chlorophyll are being produced. Some of your nucleotides and amino acids are produced during this intermediate step. You also have some fatty acids and sterols that are produced as an intermediate step in the Krebs cycle pathway. And then aspartate nucleotides, amino acids here. Okay, so the Krebs cycle can actually make several things that are useful for the cells, not just energy. Uh, microbes have the ability to degrade uh, lipids and proteins, as well as carbohydrates. Uh, triglycerides are degraded by lipases. Again, these are enzymes. Lipases are degrading triglycerides. Phospholipids are degraded by, you guessed it, phospholipases. Um, and these actually re or release fatty acid and phosphorylated head groups from glycerol. Fatty acids, once they're released by catabolism of phospholipids, then they can be further degraded by beta oxidation, and this removes the acetyl group from the fatty from the ends of the fatty acid chains. And then, of course, the acetyl groups can be coupled to coenzyme A and used in the Krebs cycle to make energy from phospholipids. You can also make energy from the triglycerides if this fatty acid can then be degraded by beta oxidation. Protein degradation involves proteases and they degrade the large proteins into peptides. And then this process can actually be used for identification purposes, especially for clinically relevant uh, bacterial pathogens. You can do experiments to detect whether uh, certain bacteria contain gelatinase. We'll be doing that in lab eight. Gelatinase degrades gelatin, which is a protein. And you can also look for caseinase, which degrades casein. Uh, so let's go into photosynthesis now, 8.6. So we already have heard of heterotrophs and autotrophs. Heterotrophs need the carbohydrates that are produced by autotrophs. Autotrophs, remember, are the ones that can use uh, solar energy to produce chemical energy. Heterotrophs cannot do that, so they depend on autotrophs. Autotrophs generally are photosynthetic organisms that use different mixtures of photosynthetic pigments, and they use these different pigments to increase the range of the wavelength of light that they can absorb. You've got photosystems, PSI, PS2, 
2, PS1, PS2, and these are the light harvesting complexes, and they're composed of lots of proteins and different photosynthetic pigments. The light dependent reactions are the ones, this is the light, light harvesting part of photosynthesis. These convert your solar energy into ATP, NADPH, and NADH, and these molecules can store the energy from light. In oxygenic photosynthesis, water is the electron donor for the reactions, and then the byproduct of that is oxygen. So we're all familiar with you know, plants that convert CO2 into oxygen. This is because of water being the electron donor. And in anoxygenic photosynthesis, water is not the electron donor. Other molecules, um, sometimes it's hydrogen sulfide, sometimes it's thiosulfate. These are the electron donors. So oxygen is not formed. Non-cyclic pho photophosphorylation is used in oxygenic photosynthesis and it produces both ATP and NADPH. But if the cell needs ATP more than it does NADPH, then it will go undergo cyclic photophosphorylation. So it can actually switch, it can turn the switch to where it only produces ATP. Light independent reactions use the ATP that's produced during the light dependent reaction. ATP and NADPH if it's doing the non-cyclic photophosphorylation and it uses that to fix CO2 and convert it into sugar. This is figure 819 and it's showing a light dependent reaction. Well, it's showing the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis where it's converting light energy into chemical energy and the products are ATP and NADPH in the non-cyclic step and then after that the ATP and NADPH are being used by the light independent reactions to fix CO2. So this, this side is showing the light dependent reactions. This side is showing the light independent carbon dioxide fixation. And you can see how the ADP is being coupled to a phosphate group. NAD plus is being uh, converted to NADPH. So this it's very similar to what we have seen in our other metabolic pathways thus far. This is figure 820. Photosynthesis in eukaryotes take place in the chloroplast, which contain thycoplasm stacked into granule. And then photosynthetic prokaryote has enfolded regions of the plasma membrane that function like thycoloids. So again, eukaryotes have much more complex structures and things than prokaryotes. And of course, eukaryotes can be multicellular and prokaryotes cannot, but you can have photosynthetic eukaryotes and you can have photosynthetic prokaryotes. It's just that eukaryotes have proper thylakoids and prokaryotes do not, they, but they do have these functional similarity with these enfolded plasma membranes that pretty much serve the same purpose as a proper chloroplast. This is figure 821 that summarizes how a photosystem works. You have your light harvesting pigments that absorb the energy from light and convert it to chemical energy, and then that chemical energy, the NADPH and ATP, is then passed from one light harvesting pigment to another light harvesting pigment until it reaches a reaction center pigment, which excites an electron. And then this electron is lost from the pigment and passed through to the electron transport chain or the electron transport system. And then it goes through ETC and produces an ADPH, an ADA, ATP. This is comparing and contrasting oxygenic photosynthesis with anoxygenic photosynthesis. So generally it's going to be your eukaryotes and cyanobacteria that do oxygenic photosynthesis where they're using uh, water as the electron acceptor and that produces oxygen in addition to glucose, right? Uh, and then the anoxygenic photosynthesis is, is generally going to be your prokaryotic bacteria and they use any number Number of electron donors they do not use water so it could be hydrogen sulfide or just straight hydrogen but it's not water and it doesn't produce oxygen so oxygenic uses water as its electron acceptor produces glucose 
oxygen, water, and oxygenic uses some other type of electron donor besides water and it does not produce oxygen. So let me pause this presentation for just a moment. Plants provide us with food to eat and oxygen to breathe. They perform this amazing feat by the process of photosynthesis. Let's take a closer look. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, which diffuses into the leaf through small pores, and then enters the cells. Inside the cell, carbon dioxide diffuses into the chloroplasts, where photosynthesis takes place. Chloroplasts use energy from light to transform carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. Zooming into a chloroplast, we see these flattened membranous sacs called thylakoids. Here, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the first phase of photosynthesis, the light reactions. The two green structures you see here are photosystems, large complexes of proteins and chlorophyll that capture light energy. An electron transport chain connects the two photosystems. Notice the small mobile electron carriers that shuttle electrons from one large complex to another. Now let's take a closer look at the steps of the light reactions. The photosystem on the left absorbs light energy, exciting electrons that enter the electron transport chain. Electrons are replaced with electrons stripped from water, creating oxygen as a byproduct. The energized electrons flow down the electron transport chain, releasing energy that is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, into the thylakoid. In the photosystem on the right, light energy excites electrons, and this time the electrons are captured by an electron carrier molecule, NADPH. The high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid powers ATP synthase, producing ATPs. The light reactions in the thylakoid have produced two energy products, ATP and NADPH, that will now power the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place outside the thylakoids in the stroma, the thick fluid of the chloroplast. At the beginning of the cycle, carbon dioxide molecules combine with molecules called RUBP. The resulting molecules go through a series of reactions powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Sugar molecules known as G3Ps are produced. Most of the G3Ps are rearranged back into RUBPs that will begin the Calvin cycle again. But the important product of photosynthesis is the remaining G3P sugar. Some G3Ps are used to build glucose, which can combine into starch or cellulose. Still other G3Ps form sucrose, and some of the sugar is broken down by cellular respiration using oxygen in the plant's own mitochondria, generating ATPs that can power other work of the plant. Excess oxygen diffuses out of the leaf through the pores, while more carbon dioxide enters. With three simple ingredients, carbon dioxide, water, and light, plants produce sugar and oxygen by photosynthesis powering plant metabolism, and ultimately providing your fuel as well. Krebs cycle is uh, part of aerobic respiration. Calvin cycle happens in what they call dark reactions. These are the light independent reactions that are in photosynthesis. Krebs is happening in the mitochondria of cells, whereas Calvin cycle happens in the stroma of chloroplasts. Krebs cycle yields ATP. Calvin cycle uses ATP. It's using ATP to synthesize organic sugars from carbon dioxide. But then it can use those sugars after that to go into the Krebs cycle. The Calvin cycle is an additional metab metabolic process that photosynthetic organisms are undergoing. The Krebs cycle takes place in all organisms that can use aerobic respiration to make energy. Calvin cycle is only happening in photosynthetic, this says plants, but also photosynthetic microbes. Carbon dioxide is produced in the Krebs cycle, it's used up in the Calvin cycle. And then Krebs cycle requires oxygen. Calvin cycle does not require oxygen. So let's move on to 8.7 biogeochemical cycles. Basically what we're looking at is the recycling of inorganic matter between living organisms and the non-living environment.
environment that, the, that they inhabit. And microbes play significant roles in this recycling. So we'll look first at the carbon cycle. In the carbon cycle, heterotrophs are degrading organic molecules to produce CO2. Throughout the Krebs cycle, we just had a look at that. CO2 is a byproduct. Autotrophs are doing the opposite, right? In the Calvin cycle, they're making organic molecules from CO2. Okay, so you already see the cycle is forming there. Something is making CO2, something else is using CO2. And then the organic molecules that are made by the autotrophs are used by the heterotrophs. We've already had a look at that. Methanogens are typically forming methane using CO2 as the final electron acceptor. Methanotrophs oxidize methane and use that as their carbon source. So here is figure 8.24 showing the carbon cycle. It says that eukaryotes participate in aerobic respiration, fermentation, and oxygenic photosynthesis. Prokaryotes participate in all of the steps shown. We'll start here with burning of fossil fuels and things, producing CO2 that goes up into the atmosphere and then eventually it rains and gets into the soil, right? It falls to the earth and gets into the soil and in the vegetation. It's eaten by animals, it's dissolved, it's introduced to water via runoff and things like that. We have marine biota and you have microbes in the soil that can use the CO2. It's a big cycle. It's kind of like the water cycle. I know you're familiar with that. The same thing is happening with carbon in the atmosphere and the soil and in vegetation and the water. In the nitrogen cycle, okay, so the nitrogen cycle is basically three, well, four steps. First, you have ammonification where nitrogen fixing bacteria will convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. So N2 is converted into NH3. That's ammonification. Then the ammonia can then be oxidized to nitrite and nitrate. And this is called nitrification. And then nitrates can then be used. They're assimilated by plants. And then soil bacteria can convert the nitrate back into nitrogen gas. So that's denitrification. So you've got ammonification, nitrification, assimilation, and then denitrification. And this is shown in figure 825. It's summarizing the nitrogen cycle. It says to note that specific groups of prokaryotic each participate in every step of the cycle and it, this one is a little it's a little more comp complicated looking than the carbon cycle just remember those four steps ammonification nitrification assimilation denitrification and then sulfur recycling this is where chemoautotrophs, so chemoautotrophs, that means that they can use chemical energy and light energy to convert hydrogen sulfide into sulfur and sulfate. And then sulfur-reducing bacteria and sulfur-reducing archaea can use sulfate as the final electron acceptor in anaerobic respiration. So this is in the absence of oxygen. And they convert it, they convert the sulfate back into hydrogen sulfide. And then we wanted to talk about runoff. We already saw an example of runoff introducing carbon and um, nitrogen and sulfur. And we'll see the sulfur in the next figure. It introduces excessive amounts of these nutrients into aquatic systems like lakes and streams and things like even the ocean and the result is this term called eutrophication where the richness is so excessive in a body of water of nitrogen or sulfur or carbon or iron where you actually have a very dense plant growth you can also have algal blooms but essentially you have a lot of animal die-off that occurs because there is a lack of oxygen in the water the water becomes deoxygenated and this is this is the sulfur cycle prokaryotes that are participating in anaerobic respiration to convert sulfate back into hydrogen sulfide and just note that in all three of these figures we are seeing it's kind of like everything culminates in the in the water supply and then that's when we have to worry about this eutrophication now let's talk about bio remediation this is where you can take advantage of the metabolic activity Activities of microbes. So we know about the different cycles of nutrients and how they are facilitated by microbial metabolism. Well, 
in bioremediation, scientists can actually take advantage of these metabolic uh, characteristics of microbes in order to remove or to break down contamination and pollutants and things. And they can do that by either introducing non-native microbes to a region or they can genetically engineer microbes in order to do what they need them to do or they can even just promote the growth of microbes that already do these things. Bio-augmentation is actually where they're introducing these microbes to non-natively to an area that they're not usually living in and then the biostimulation is where they're promoting the growth of these native organisms so they can add things to the water to get these organisms that are already living there to grow and fast and you know speed up their rate of remediation. So and finally here are some examples of bioremediation. This one you probably hadn't really thought too much about but sometimes when you have a crime scene there's blood, semen, all kinds of bodily fluids and if there's even a possibility of there being uh, hepatitis maybe or HIV or um, MRSA, you know, you don't want these things spreading around. Depending on the amount of body bodily fluids, it might actually be detrimental to use bleach or ammonia to clean these things. These are really harsh chemicals and it depends on where you are. You know, you may not want to introduce those chemicals to the environment. So they do have biological enzymes that can break those things down and help to clean up the crime scenes. Contaminated soil, they use a lot of microbes to remediate soil that's been contaminated with toxins and things that were introduced by humans, um, soil and groundwater. And we kind of talked about this a little bit already when we're talking about the carbon and nitrogen and sulfur cycles. And then of course the oil spill cleanups. So you actually have microbes that can degrade oil. And these were used when they were trying to clean up the uh, the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And they did both actually. They 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 introduced oil degrading microbes and then they also um, introduced nutrients and things to stimulate the growth of oil degrading microbes that were already living there and also the ones that they introduced. So they really, really were trying to speed up the process and they were using microorganisms to do that. So that's it for the lesson eight material. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Please check the description in the Please check the description for this video for more videos related to the topics we covered in Lesson 8. And leave your questions for me in the comments section below. <laughs>